pandemic has changed many things about how businesses operate. This includes their strategies on sustainability. Accelerating the green transformation doesn't mean sacrifices for driving growth. Being more efficient can help reduce waste and improve the world. Companies today are actively transforming their operations to be more sustainable, and they're going beyond simple changes in manufacturing and design. These corporate decision makers are playing a key role in a much larger transformation around how people live and work. I'd like to introduce to you Ari Trastal, the CEO of CRISP, a company reducing food waste through data, and Mark Fronmeyer, founder and president of Arkimoto, a small footprint electric vehicle company. Both of them are entrepreneurs of multiple companies. All right, when was the moment that inspired your sustainable business? No, thank you, Karen. Uh, an honor to be on the panel to discuss this topic. Um, in 2016, I was uh, very fortunate to sell my last uh, technology company called Tapad. I was tired and beaten up as an uh, ent entrepreneur after 20 years of constantly running out of money and losing for that, losing that important client, or um, we can't get the technology to work. And uh, when that sale actually happened, or the business happened on my business, I figured, what can I do as a birthday gift to my, to my family? So we took the uh, entire family and we traveled around the world for 14 uh, months. A girl four and a boy eight. So which was an amazing thing for us as a family, but we also uh, during that time uh, saw all of these paradoxes in the world. So we were in India one week and we saw kids uh, that are the same age as my kids um, with a lot of food insecurities. And the week after we were in New Zealand and we saw apples uh, rotting in the field. And I kind of came to understand after that, that a third of all of the food that is produced in the world is actually lost before it reaches a consumer. As consumers, we always think about uh, that we shouldn't waste uh, food, but a lot of this food is actually disappearing in the supply chain, one third of all that the food that's produced. So that was the inspiration to kind of see kind of what can we do with technology, what can we do with data to help uh, fix this large imbalance. Uh, it is a huge paradox that we have one billion people that live with food insecurities, and at the same time, uh, we have one third of all the food going to waste. So we think about this as a triple bottom line. We think about it as we want to design something that's good for the world, number one. Number two, good for our customers. And number three, good for us in that order. We call it the triple bottom line. So we're a data platform that allows uh, data to flow much easier uh, so that everybody can, can plan and be better uh, and not lose this important food that we need. Mark, it sounds like that company actually has a lot in common with you and your use of technology and focus on efficiency. Can you tell us more about your company? Yeah, well, it sounds like Ari has uh, definitely have a familiarity with those the the struggles of bringing something, uh, you know, through through the development process and actually that that entrepreneurial journey is its own story. But uh, I actually came at Arkimoto uh, originally. I was I, I sold a company in 2007 doing video games and uh, went looking for a sustainable way of getting around town. Um, there's there's this huge disconnect between the vehicles we drive and, and, and how we actually use them. So, you know, cars are 4,000 pound machines uh, that can carry five to seven people, but we typically drive them alone or with just one other person uh, with a relatively small amount of stuff, a relatively short distance. And so I actually went to the market looking for something to buy that would solve that problem in a much more sustainable way that would be all electric, emission-free, affordable, high quality, and I was I was sort of shocked in 2007 that I couldn't find anything not not locally not in the world that really hit the sweet spot for daily transport and that was that was kind of the the genesis point for Arkimoto was uh, I actually saw a, a three wheeled kit vehicle in a parade and it was that light bulb moment that that illuminated the giant gap between the bike and the car and so that was you know 2007 spent the first seven years just refining the basic idea of a new vehicle platform uh, focused around the last mile or really like the last 10 miles uh, type trips that we take. And we went into production in 2019. Uh, of course, this last year, uh, going through you know, the very early phases of production of elect an electric vehicle in the middle of a global pandemic has been its own uh, real treat. Um, but uh, but we're, you know, we, we're deeply committed to uh, really right-sizing the footprint of trans 
transportation, rethinking the 50% of our cities that we pave over for moving and parking cars. Uh, and ultimately, we see what we're building really is at the confluence of uh, autonomy, lightweight electric platforms, shared mobility. And that's a really key piece of driving a solution to carbon emissions. The transportation sector is a huge emitter of carbon. Uh, and we think we can uh, make a big dent as, and make cities not suck anymore at the same time. That's a great intro to my next question, which is, uh, you know, the food industry as well as the transportation industry saw huge shifts as a result of the pandemic. In addition to that, there were concerns in regards to long-term effects on supply chain and operations. I'm really curious about how the pandemic affected both of your companies in operations specifically. And Ari, right, let's start with you, uh, especially with your partnerships uh, with different companies and how they were managing their food waste around the world. Yeah, it's uh, it was uh, was uh, an incredibly in interesting part uh, of our journey as a company. Uh, you have you know, food is the largest industry in the world. Uh, there are it's about a ten trillion dollar industries. There are probably more than 100 million companies buying and selling and getting the food and transporting the food and getting the food uh, from where it's produced to the consumer. And 8 billion people need this product three times a day. So it's a big industry. Uh, it's also an incredibly complex web of companies that are trading with each other and getting that product uh, uh, to, to the consumer. And before the pandemic, kind of our food waste story was a cute story, but it wasn't anything that people needed to do anything about uh, because nothing was broken. Um, and then the pandemic hit, and I think uh, everybody in the industry saw uh, that it was broken, that was truly broken. We had the paradox you saw in uh, news stories where people were pouring milk out and they were plowing their, their, their produce back into the, uh, into the fields. And at the same time, you see at the supermarket and there are no milk or produce on the shelves. So I think the pandemic forced everybody in this industry to actually start breaking open these supply chains that, uh, that they haven't touched in, 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 in 30 years and understanding how they can be much more proactive. How can they actually share data and how can they share data throughout this very complex uh, web uh, of companies. So for, for, for the company's perspective, it was a huge catalyst uh, for us. Uh, and as an entrepreneur, you always uh, you always kind of build technology, build product, you get team in place, and then you don't know how long it's going to take before you actually get market traction with the product. And during the pandemic, we got a tremendous amount of market traction. Um, so, so that was uh, positive and very positive, I think, also for the industry. Uh, also had a very big impact on us as a company, but maybe we can address that uh, later. But uh, it's a huge catalyst uh, for us and drive huge change in the industry. Yeah, I think it, what you're describing also connects to, um, I, I really want to hear about Mark's experience, especially in regards to the increased interest in sales in smaller footprint electric vehicles that happened during the pandemic in 2020, especially as people were cooking much more at home. And I'd love to hear, uh, but there was a lot of concern in regards to sourcing and manufacturing um, key components and parts. So Mark, I really want to hear uh, what was your experience at Arkimoto, uh, you know, when there was concerns in regards to shipping, as well as uh, increased demand for vehicles like yours? Yeah, it's, it's, been, a, it's been a really wild last you know, 14, 15 months now. Uh, because you know, the, 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 That shift to sort of relocalizing everybody um, it really was, a, I think, a, a big uh, catalyst for a, a different look at the Arkimoto platform. We, we have a vehicle that is focused on sort of consumer transportation. We have one that's focused on last mile delivery, one that's focused on emergency response, all built on the same platform. And that, you know, we, we launched our first pilot of the Deliverator right before last mile delivery just sort of went to the moon. What we're doing right now, communicating over Skype, I mean, this would at one point have been uh, an in-person conference that would have required everybody to travel to it and, and instead, Everyone's getting it at home. We're at, at our homes talking to each other. I would say that this technology is sort of the uh, w one of the greatest advances in sustainable transportation that we've seen in the last decade. And so we had to, on an operations perspective, we had to radically adjust our processes. Everybody went home who possibly could. We had production shutdowns in at very of various lengths in all four quarters of 2020. We've dealt with massive supply chain disruptions uh, in the industry as a whole. And you know, it's just keeping up with 
you, you're missing one part, you don't ship a product. But at the same time, you know, Arkimoto has certainly benefited from uh, the, the rising awareness about the electric vehicle, um, the a relook at how we transport ourselves. There were many areas in the world that saw clean skies for the first times in some people's lives during the beginning of the pandemic as, as industries shuttered operations. And I think that that has it's kind of a long term effect. With that juggling, you know, there is still the need for you to continue to build out with the growth and interest in both of your companies and the, you know, the expansion and interest in the things that you're doing connected to sustainability. I'm really curious how both of you competed with larger companies for talent, uh, especially as there were more uh, remote opportunities. And oftentimes when you're doing interviews, quite often people would come in and meet you in person for interviews or final rounds and you know, classic conversations about culture fit. So if we could talk, uh, especially when it comes to uh, in the food and electric vehicle industries, which are hyper competitive right now, Ari, uh, would you like to start about how you compete, especially around the world for different types of talent? Yeah, it is incredibly competitive out there. We have the big Facebooks and Amazons and the big technology companies that are throwing, a lot, uh, throwing, throwing around a lot of money to get the best talent uh, on board. Um, so we typically, we start, everybody who joins Chris feel that they have a connection to the mission that we, that we have uh, as a company. So we actually kind of go around the virtual table these days, but it used to be a meeting room table and everybody tells their own story. Why does this matter to them? And that can be a story of growing up in the US uh, with, with very little money and uh, having to go to the grocery store and sending products back, can't afford it. And so food is connected very closely. Or growing up uh, in a different country, immig uh, immigrating to the US and then building their career in the US, very successful executives, uh, but can have a background where they really connected to that we don't we don't want to waste food and all they always wanted to be a part of solving that problem. But how can they actually do that in something that also help, but it also can help build a technology company. Just last night, we hired this uh, amazing female leader uh, into the into the company. She took uh, was a part of a company that grew from nothing to five, six billion of revenue. And she could have joined any company. Everybody wants her to join the company. But uh, now is the next kind of st step in her, her career as well. How can she now connect and solve a bigger problem, so, so, solve something that really matters to her? How can she use this technology skills that she has built for 20, 25 years and apply them to a very large problem? Um, so, I think the, uh, so I think the connection to a mission matters, uh, matters a lot. We did a survey internally here and we see that about 46% have an idealistic focus in, 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 in what they want to do uh, versus the general market that is, uh, is, is 15%. So I think, but at the same time, they also want to apply the knowledge and skills that they have built to a very large problem. Mark, what you do combines engineering and ideas about sustainability and manufacturing and also partnerships with a lot of government agencies, as well as, like you said, that last mile for delivery. Could you tell me more about how you're competing with much larger companies or famous names, as Ari mentioned, for talent in these different areas? I would sort of echo uh, a lot of the sentiments that Ari expressed. You, the, Arkimoto is a deeply mission-driven organization. Uh, and to a person, I think everyone coming on board understands that and buys into uh, you know, we're, we're trying to make a really significant impact in terms of solving the climate problem. And I would say over the last year, the pandemic in some ways made it a lot easier for us to bring world-class talent uh, onto the team and attacking the problem. And part of it was, you know, we, you, Eugene is, Eugene, Oregon is a pretty small town. So getting somebody to relocate out here can be a real challenge. But in the, in, in the pandemic times, we, said, you know, you don't have to move. In fact, you can't. We're going to just, we will, if you're remote, you just stay remote uh, until we're through this. And we really built the processes around being able to work with teams all over the planet. We brought on Monroe and Associates, world-class automotive engineering outfit uh, led by Sandy Monroe. Uh, we, we brought on some amazing talent on the electric drivetrain and battery side. And then uh, just that, that has been... Uh, really, I think, an opportunity to be able to collaborate with people 
uh, without having to uproot and uh, and move and take a risk on a small town. So I think it's actually been a real, uh, that's, that's been one of the bright points for us is being able to work with world-class people on a problem that we deeply care about. That's great to hear that, you know, often we've heard so many downsides from the pandemic, but it's great to hear the upsides for both of your companies in terms of the recruitment of talent that can really benefit and make these companies grow significantly as discussions about sustainability continue to become much more mainstream. I think in the sustainability space, there are still a lot of misconceptions, especially with both of you being repeat entrepreneurs and communicating what you do to investors and new clients. I'm really curious, even with this greater awareness that you've both talked about, about sustainability as a result of the pandemic, what are some of the persistent misconceptions and, and wrong ideas about especially growth in the sustainability industry? I would love to hear, especially when it comes to the food space, uh, you alluded to how complicated it is. Have you heard about it feeling like too much of a challenge? Yeah, I think there are a couple of mis- uh, conceptions. The first one is we are all as consumers, we are really trained to think about us as consumers not wasting food. And we should fo- uh, should definitely continue to think about that. It's an incredibly important part of the whole equation. Um, so it takes a little for a consumer to think about the complexity of a food supply chain to get food uh, to the grocery store or to a restaurant. Often there are eight to 12, maybe 15 different steps in this value chain. Uh, it can be a grower or a farmer uh, in a foreign country. They work with a co-op and they aggregate up all of these uh, and, uh, and for produce or for fruit, for instance. Now there's an exporter, then there's an importer, and then there is somebody buying it and packaging together and putting it in, uh, in, in their product or wholesalers and logistics companies. There is So I think the, the biggest misconception for us is just uh, for everybody to understand how un- unbelievably complex these 100 million companies, how complex that structure is. Um, so that's number one. And number two, I think it's just how on earth can you actually change that? So what are the solutions to it? Because the problem is so great and the problem is such, uh, such such an important one to solve. And a lot of one is how can we actually have an impact? Where can we start? What companies do we ha- need uh, on board the platform to have that, uh, that, 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 that huge uh, impact? Um, and a lot a lot of misconception is also around most people believe that large, small, medium sized companies do not want to share their data because there can be some competitive information, pricing information and stuff like that. So that was also what I thought before jumping into this industry. The biggest challenge is going to be around getting uh, these large companies to actually share. Um, But the learning was the opposite, incredibly positive. Um, They want to share. There just haven't been any tools uh, in place to share this data. So now that the tools are in place, now data can flow and be much more, but much more real time. And it can allow everybody to be proactive versus reactive. We get it out of these silos where data just goes to die um, and uh, into a place where where everybody has access to it. So those are the kind of the big misconceptions uh, that we've kind of run, run across, but slowly uh, changing it. Mark, I'm going to give you the quick last word, um, but I want to reframe the question by saying, what is the misconception regarding the future of the sustainability space? Well, I would say biggest misconception is and related particularly to sustainability is that people can't change. Uh, you know, this is a ultimately, this is a social networking exercise. If we all lean in, we can fix the problems we've got. Uh, and uh, the idea that, that we can't change our ways, I think, was really put to rest at the beginning of the pandemic as m- massive numbers of people radically shifted their behavior patterns overnight. Uh, and so I think that the other misperception is that we can take our time. Uh, we, uh, this, is, this problem of sustainability is something we got to tackle right now, and we can do it as long as we're all on board. What we're talking about today is directly connected to the heat waves in California, the rising temperatures in the Pacific Northwest, and many other parts of the world. It's clear sustainability needs to be a priority for many more companies right now, rather than several years into the future. Thank you again to my guests, Chris CEO, R.A. Trostal, and Mark Fraunmeier, founder and president of Arkimoto.